Hello everybody and welcome to our Governance Evaluator Risk Management webinar series. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Gabby Fennessy, who is our guest speaker and our guest presenter. Um, Gabby received quite a lot of questions before um, our PowerPoint and presentation today, and we've actually taken those on board, and I think Gabby is covering most of those in her presentation. And those that we aren't, we're going to stop during the presentation and bring some of those up and we're also going to communicate with people after our presentation today. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Gabby and say thank you very much to Gabby and VMIA for our presentation today. Great, thanks very much, uh, Fee. Thanks everybody for logging in today and um, hopefully this will be quite an interesting session. Uh, my name's Gabby, I'm a Senior Risk Advisor for the Victorian Managed Insurance Authority. Uh, for people who don't know who we are, we are the state-based insurer uh, for uh, publicly funded organisations. Um, we do a whole range of things besides uh, insurance. Um, we work in the prevention state to help people uh, reduce harm and run a lot of education and training sessions like this one today. Um, obviously when things go wrong, floods, fires, etc., we're there to help organisations recover. We also have a role in uh, assuring government that uh, organisations they fund are actually across their risk management. Um, so we have quite a wide range of uh, activities uh, that we do with people uh, across the state. Right, today um, we're going to be looking at risks, risk management for boards. So some of this will be around uh, looking at board roles and responsibilities, what their obligations are, um, having a look from the board's perspective about uh, risk and what questions you could ask of the organisation and also have a think about how you might take uh, some ideas back to uh, your board or to work if you're a member of staff um, to build on what you, we're doing today. Right, so always love to start with a definition. Uh, risk management. Um, a lot of what I talked about today is based on the ISO and Australian New Zealand standard around risk management. Uh, risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Um, what I want you to concentrate and think about today are two really important words in this definition. One is the word uncertainty and the other is on objectives because risk is all about trying to think about and understand uncertainty. And from a board perspective, this is really about what organisational strategic objectives um, are uncertain. Right, um, it's also quite helpful to, I suppose, communicate what risk is not. And I find working with uh, a lot of clients out there, especially healthcare organisations, they find that this particular slide is a really important and meaningful one. Um, my background is in healthcare and I've spent a lot of my time in healthcare organisations worrying about incidents and hazards. This is something in healthcare that we are absolutely obsessed with and for good reason because we want to keep our patients safe and in human services we want to keep our clients safe and our staff safe as well. Risk is not incidents. Um, so these are things like people having falls, um, banging their heads, tripping over, that type of thing. These are actually things that have already happened that we know about. Hazards are not risks. So this might be the roof is leaking, we've got um, carpet curling up at the edges. Uh, they might actually eventuate in some harm, uh, but they're not risks either. Issues are not risks. These are things that are problems or things that are influencing org the organisation, um, might be um, something to do with workforce that we know that we're having real difficulty in recruiting in our area. That's actually an issue we know about. So it's really something that's here and now. Events as well are not risks. So that might be flood, um, a natural disaster. These are things that we know are going to happen or have happened. Um, they're not risks either. So um, just so that we're all on the same page and understand what risk is not, I think is quite an important starting point. Um, I visit a lot of organisations and are presented with risk registers and they have a whole range of incidents and topics around hazards um, and that's not our perspective about what risk is. 
Right, um, from a board perspective, that there, there are a lot of risk management obligations. Um, I don't want to worry people about these because there's lots of advice, information and help out there to help you understand these particular uh, roles and responsibilities. From a state government perspective and a Victorian perspective, um, all of these different uh, pieces of legislation and ministerial standing directions um, have an influence on what organisations and boards must do. One I'm going to talk about today is the Victorian Government Risk Management Framework. This has um, been updated uh, this year and has really changed or I suppose raised the bar on risk management roles and responsibilities uh, including attestation through the um, annual report. So what are the board's responsibilities in relation to risk? Well, the board's got a whole stack of roles and responsibilities and I'm sure that the governance evaluator fleshes out a lot of these over time. Um, one is obviously your legislative uh, obligations. Uh, one is to be across the quality of the services that you're providing, to understand the functions and structures of the services um, that are providing human services or whatever else you're doing. And one of the responsibilities is also to be across risk management. All of these obligations really, from a governance perspective, have an interaction with your strategic plan and should all be embedded and thought about uh, when you develop up your corporate plan. There's also a director's code of conduct in Victoria and this would be the same for other states uh, that really spell out what directors um, should be thinking and how they should be behaving. So I'm not going to read those out, but you can see that there are actually nine points. I think the boards often get bogged down in uh, point six, financial responsibility, there, but there are a whole range of other more broad responsibilities. And I also often see this with audit and risk committees, that they are obsessed with finances, but don't look more broadly at what organisational risks may be happening within the organisation. Right, the Victorian um, Risk Management Framework was updated in March 2015. Sorry, that was last year. Time flies when you're having fun with VGRMF. There's now 10 mandatory requirements that all boards um, must meet or be aware of. Um, this particular document is available online. Uh, VMIA provide lots and lots of guidance and um, information about uh, what the VGRMF means and practical things about what you can do to meet these obligations. Um, and I'll give you our website um, at the end of this presentation so that you can download lots of free goodies um, to help you with this particular um, issue. One of the uh, areas that I suppose is um, fairly relevant to boards, especially uh, the chair, is um, that you must at a test each year that your risk management arrangements have been reviewed and uh, do meet uh, the requirements of the state government in Victoria. Right, risk management needs a framework and uh, part of the attestation and mandatory criteria uh, from government is that all organisations need to have a risk management framework. This isn't just a document, pieces of paper, it's actually the living, breathing system for managing risk in the organisation. So organisations must have risk governance. That means that there needs to be a clear understanding of the roles and responsibilities, both of the board and the executive and how they interact and in the communication between them. There needs to be a risk policy, a risk strategy. There needs to be some attention made to uh, risk appetite, which I'll talk a bit, bit about later. And organisations need to understand their risk culture. So all of these things uh, should be happening and ticking along all the time in a bit of a risk management ecosystem. To support that, there should be um, clearly understood and articulated risk management processes and resources need to be put aside by all organisations to manage that risk. So that may be people, but it might be information technology, data, etc. Risk management is focused on in lots of different organisations at lots of different levels of organisations. And I know in health and human services, um, a lot of our activity is based on one-to-one -one risk of looking after clients, visitors, families, friends, etc. Um, this, as I said before, is really based around incidents and hazard focus. Uh, some of it is about transferring risks, whether that's to another organisation that might be able to cope with this better. So not doing heart, heart transplant, uh, 
work out in rural Victoria, uh, we would refer patients on to tertiary centres. Um, often risk is viewed as bad uh, or something to be avoided. Uh, today I'm going to be talking at the higher level, uh, talking around strategic risk and where the attention of the board is. Often I have board members contact me who are quite worried that they're being um, dragged down into the operational nitty gritty and that's not where board's attention should be. In the middle we have uh, managing risk. Um, this I suppose is the role of management and executive within the organisation to ensure that systems and processes are in place for managing risk and the focus is often on mitigation. And in this area we also have things like project management risk as well. Thinking at a strategic level, which is what I'll be talking about mainly today, um, we look at risk as uncertainty. Remember, cast your minds back to that uh, definition I gave you. It's all about uncertainty, uncertainty, but also perhaps looking at risk as a way of optimising what we're doing or as an opportunity. Well, we had some questions around risk management and strategy. Um, and so I just thought I'd put this in. Risk management, as I said, can apply to lots of different levels in the organisation. It can be at a strategic level, so thinking of our strategic plan, but also our day-to-day -day business. So we can call these enterprise risk and business risk as well. So they happen at different levels of the organisation. If I'm uh, talking to members of the board, I really ask them if they're wanting to concentrate at a strategic level about what uncertainty do we have in meeting our strategic objectives. I would hope that all of you have had a look at your strategic plan and have a pretty good understanding of the goals within the strategic plan. Uh, my question would be uh, back to you, have you had any analysis or discussion um, around your strategic goals? Um, has there been any discussion during the uh, away day you had to develop up your strategic plan about what the risks might be? Or afterwards, have you had anybody discuss with you what the uncertainties are for meeting your strategic objectives. Um, strategic plans get updated all the time, so sometimes boards actually revisit their strategic risks on a regular basis, so it might be every 12 to 24 months. Are risks, uh, if you have actually identified some in relation to your strategic objective, are they actually described in a way in which you can understand what the causes of the risks are and what the impact will be on your strategic objectives? And what are the plans to address these risks? If you haven't got a plan, um, how can you actually get this discussion started at a board meeting or in your audit and risk committee? These last three points, if you're answering no to those, um, my advice would be to really ask your executive and other members of the board about these issues and perhaps get that on the agenda. Pop in and ask a sure. question. I've got a few questions here. This is a particularly a point of interest for a lot of people. Um, one of the, the main questions is uh, not only how do you know if you've identified all your risks, mm -hmm. so I guess really the question is, um, is that an ongoing thing? Like you can't know them all straight away. And uh, that, I, I would say that um, them? how do we know if we've identified them because we've gone through some sort of systematic planned activity of okay. looking at all of our strategic objectives. Um, so from my experience we go and run workshops with organisations to concentrate only on their strategic objectives and what the uncertainties are to meeting those objectives. If you've got 20 strategic risks, you've got too many. Most organisations we would recommend probably only have four to five strategic risks. Um, in hospital land especially, most organisations only have four to six strategic goals and for some of those strategic goals there may be no strategic risks, if that okay. makes sense. Okay. So these are big ticket ones. If you've got a lot of them, I would ask perhaps they're operational and need to be treated as business risk rather than Great. strategic. And a lot of people are wondering, is there an example of what a strategic risk might look like uh, even outside of health? And how often should we monitor them? Is that something that should come to the board every Every month? year. Um, it or should be year, totally revamped, but it should be on a regular basis. So it could be quarterly as a minimum to really mm. talk about them. You might want to do one per meeting, etc. cetera, um, but there should be monitoring and feedback going on all the time, especially with your audit and risk committee. And there should be information then fed up to the board about how we are performing on our strategic risks. And what would be like an example of it? uncertainty? 
Um, it might be around merging of health services okay. that we are um, not sure what the state government will be doing about that. Have we had any discussions with our neighbours down the road to see um, how this might play out? Have we done any scenario planning for this? Uh, strategic risk might be in aged care services about the changes to the aged care market or the National Disability Insurance Scheme is another game changer that has created a lot of um, uncertainty in the market. Thanks Gabby, because that covers quite a few questions mm. about that aged care sector as well. Thank you. Okay, another um, item that organisations need to be across is this concept of risk culture. Uh, I suppose risk culture really can't be divided away from the organisational culture. We do know in organisations that if you've got good culture, you perform very well. Um, and sorry, I keep alluding back to healthcare um, examples, but that's my experience. Uh, poor culture actually has an impact, a negative impact on patient outcomes. So if you've got good culture, you have better patient outcomes and higher uh, patient experiences or better patient experiences. So from a board perspective, risk culture is really about uh, you as board members knowing your accountabilities for setting the tone uh, because the tone for culture comes from the top, um, whether you like it or not. So your attitude towards culture and your expectations around values and behaviour is really quite important. An awareness, both at board level, executive and across staff, needs to be um, raised around uh, what is this thing called risk and what is culture and your attitudes as well. So all of these things add up to behaviours that happen within the organisation. So a lot of organisations will be doing um, patient engagement uh, surveys. They could also sort of add a separate perspective. Staff engagement surveys um, are really quite an important way to pick up on culture. You might also pick that up uh, from doing a whole range of other face-to-face -face activities. And in large organisations, you may have very different cultures across different divisions or across different sites as well. So this thing around risk culture is a area of growing interest amongst boards. And I often put it back to them. Uh, how many discussions have you had around culture at board level? And uh, it's interesting, the response. Right, questions at a board level that might get you to understand uh, organisational risk. Um, I get this question quite a lot that um, people don't know what questions to ask. Uh, sometimes they feel a bit out of their depth, depth but I think uh, you really do need to start asking the executive um, and the audit and risk committee to share information with you. Uh, does your organisation actually have a risk profile, a risk strategy or a risk plan and how often are these updated? Do we have a risk register? How often is that updated and how do we add items or sometimes how do we take them off? Um, I see organisations that have 150 risks on it and that becomes really quite complicated for boards to deal with. They feel overwhelmed and they don't know how to make sense of the information. Um, risk re registers always seem to be a bit of a point of pain. Um, as I said before to you, Fee, um, having too many risks, um, especially at a strategic level, is just too difficult to tackle uh, at a board level. Um, is risk discussed at the board level and how often during the year? Does the Audit and Risk Committee provide the board with a report? So not just the minutes of their meeting, is there sort of some analysis or some key messages that need to go up to the board? So I'd be asking those questions back to the Chair of your Audit and Risk Committee. Uh, could we have you report, even if it's an oral report, uh, at the next board meeting? Actions, what sort of things are going on within the organisation um, that you can, I suppose, ask about? Are risk owners completing controls and mitigation and feeding, feeding these back to the Audit and Risk Committee? Audit and Risk should be monitoring these across uh, their agenda across the year to see what act actions are going. Are the risks increasing or decreasing? Are we receiving reports and presentations on strategic or very high risks? Um, there I suppose is a bit of a reticence of getting people from the business to come and present to you, but I think it's really a good way for the board to be in touch with what's happening for staff and what's going on for them and how, what their perceptions and understanding of risk is. And do we have comfort that the organisation is meeting its compliance obligations? How do we do that and where's the evidence? So the um, Victorian Risk Management Framework actually outlines all of those and um, BMI IA has created a practice guide which can actually make sense of that as well. We also have a great attestation guide where boards can read that and ask questions about what is the evidence for um, 
making sure that risk management is happening in our organisation. Information to understand risk. So this was a question that came up as well, Fee, about how, especially if I'm pressed for time, do I pull together or have information presented to me that can help me make sense of what's going on in the organisation? Understanding risk is more than just looking at a risk register. Um, this is just really a snapshot uh, of, um, and should actually, I suppose, you should be able to burrow down and see what the controls and mitigations are if you need them rather than just looking at a whole headline of titles. So I'd be a bit concerned if I was sitting on uh, the board and I saw a shopping list of different topics. Um, a good risk register will actually describe them properly um, so that any lay person should be able to understand them just by having a quick look. Um, one thing you can use is a dashboard to monitor the movement um, of the risks, the controls and mitigation as well. Uh, that's something that uh, Governance Evaluator has asked me to come back and do a presentation on. Uh, I don't know if that's this year or next year, but uh, that'll be really interesting to talk about key risk indicators, etc. What other data is the organisation collecting that might be linked to risk? Uh, a good example is workforce. What's your turnover like? Uh, what's your absenteeism like, etc. Are there indicators out there that could actually um, fulfil some of this? Key risk indicators, as I've just mentioned, are something um, they need quite a bit of work and development, but I'd say don't get confused between those and performance indicators. Um, a lot of boards do receive performance indicators about, especially around the financial area, um, but they can look like a bit of a fruit salad of information. So a dashboard is a way of really cutting across too much information just to give you traffic light system to understand um, what's going on. In your board and audit and risk committee agendas, are you keeping uh, strategic topics um, on the agenda and discussing those and perhaps doing a deep dive? My recommendation would be that the board has a calendar of uh, issues for the organisation that it has a deep dive on on a regular basis. So you might talk about IT at one particular board meeting, workforce at another, get somebody from the business to come and discuss those risks might talk about culture in one board meeting, uh, clinical in one meeting and community engagement in another one. So we do see really good examples of uh, good practice where the 12 months is actually um, outlined th those different areas of the business and what's going to be discussed across the year. Hmm. I'd actually just jump in and ask you a question there just sure. to flush out that um, area of monitoring risk on the board because one of the things that people, uh, particularly those writing in questions, are saying, it can become really boring mm. and laborious and um, a lot of people kind of glaze over. Mm. And um, I think your point about is there's too many things it's too much to deal with. Do you have any good tips or any examples that you've seen of how um, it can be brought to the board and made more interesting? I heard you just say that um, Having staff um, from the staff business, staff from those areas of the business is really good. Uh, so, what are some other tips that might be helpful to to engage directors and make them? Um, more I think the power of storytelling is really quite important as well. Yeah. So, you might uh, be talking about cyber risk at a particular board meeting. So, is there a case study? I think the Melbourne Health example is a really great one of their cyber breaches that they had. You might. Uh, provide a summary to the board about here's a story of what happened elsewhere just to make it more relevant yeah, and lively. Mm -hmm. um, around con community engagement you might get a member of the community to come and talk about their perspectives or tell a story. Um, in organisations I've worked in uh, we've had adverse events where a patient's been injured during their hospital stay and they've been really passionate about their care and what went wrong. Very powerful to bring those sorts of stories into the boardroom to illustrate why governance in these areas is so important. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. All right, risk appetite explained. This is always a mysterious issue for people. Um, I find that they get quite worried about it. Um, if we go back to thinking about strategic objectives, um, I would say it's at that level that you would apply your risk appetite. Um, some organisations uh, ask if we should have an overarching risk appetite. Well, you can't really um, have an overarching one statement for the whole organisation regarding your risk appetite. So what is risk appetite? 
that's, I suppose, the organisation's desire to do something or not to do something. And tolerance is how much uh, you're going to do it by. So I always like to keep it simple and have a nice, easy explanation. I've got an appetite for going on an overseas holiday next year, Fee. Um, so my tolerance is how much money am, am I going to spend? Am I going to take out a loan or am I going to have an overdraft on my bank account? Um, am I going to go to Bali or am I going to do a big trip to North America? So that sort of really, taught, I suppose, hopefully makes it more clear what appetite is. Um, often it, it might be around expanding into a new service area for an organisation, but you've got to work out what your tolerance is for doing that. Are you going to uh, divert money from another service? Do you actually have to develop up a new skill set and employ staff, etc.? So um, happy later if um, people want to contact me, um, I can provide them with some examples of risk appetite. This is quite a tricky one for a lot of organisations. Sure. Drop a little question in there. Mm. Um, something that we're continually asked, and we even have some questions in this webinar, mm. do all organisations need to have this a risk appetite state and tolerance statement? Um, or, you know, like some people have said, Shh, is it relevant to health, for example? Oh, it is relevant to health. Um, I suppose most boards and uh, audit and risk committees will actually really think about the finances as a first stepping stone to developing up a um, risk appetite statement. So we're running a service, how much in the red are we going to go? Are we going to actually have a 5% saving across the year so that we can use that um, in other service development, etc. So that's one way of starting uh, your risk appetite thinking and move forward with that um, okay. as well. For smaller organisations, I think that really worrying about risk appetite too early is a bit premature. You really want to see that you've got your policies, frameworks and staff understand things first. Get your own house in order before you start thinking about your risk appetite. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Right, so the benefits of um, risk management are quite varied. Um, it actually helps organisations make informed decisions about where they're going. Um, uh, are we going to do this particular business, are we not? Um, it improves performance because we know what we're up to and we know what our uncertainties are. And as I said, it can have an impact on outcomes for the organisation. Right, I'm going to leave a lot of time to answer questions, Fee, if you'd like to at the end of this uh, discussion. I've, I've whipped through the content pretty quickly, actually. I don't know if that's because I talk uh, like a thrashing machine. Um, what I'd really like organisations to think about is, from this information, what um, could you take back to work today? I'm really interested in stuff that people can use and take away, even if that's, well, I think I need to explore more and understand more about this area around risk. Um, there's lots of resources out there that you can use and look into. Um, I also encourage people to think about what they could do differently or what they could take away from presentations like this today. So um, I think we'll get on to some of the questions shortly. Yes, yeah. sure. Um, one of the areas where the uh, dashboard is really lit up is risk appetite. So yep. if we can just go back to that yep, area sure. for a minute. Mm. Um, one of the things that uh, one of the questions that's been asked is, how are you actually able to ensure that all the board members have the same risk appetite and how do you manage if they don't? And that's a really good question because it's not just the risk of the organisation. Correct. It's the risk, uh, it's about the people sitting around the table on the board mm. understanding their own appetite, appetite for mm. risk. And I, th I think yeah. you, you may have somebody who's really into entrepreneurial activities and really wants to push the boundaries about what... Uh, may have been quite a conservative organisation and what we want to do. Oh, we're going to go out and get this new business, et cetera, et cetera. I think that you've got to really um, get your facts together, uh, do some research, um, understand the consequences of different scenarios. So perhaps we're going to have a 10% overspend this year. Well, what's the impact for that? Does that mean that, um, you know, we're going to have to stop doing a whole bunch of other things that Department of Health are going to frown on us, etc., etc. Um, it needs to really be evidence and fact-based. The decision making it can't be just, you know, 
we all want to go and be entrepreneurial next week. There has to be something behind it. It might also be what are the competitors in the market doing. An example of that would be aged care. Uh, for a lot of public aged care facilities, they're quite concerned about um, private providers moving into town. So what's their appetite for expanding the service? Um, is this the purpose of our organisation? Are we providing health and aged care or just health nowadays? So. I think uh, there's got to be quite a bit of negotiation around that, but it needs to be fa informed appetite development. Probably a positive thing if people have different risk yes. appetites sitting around the table because mm. that helps um, really test the conversation. Absolutely. But um, am I also hearing that um, directors themselves should understand their own risk appetite and that and therefore the bias they bring to that conversation? Yes. And that and that's helpful. Yes. And I suppose, is there any tricks for actually helping directors to understand that about themselves or is it just a conversation that needs to be had in risk management training or? Um, in a... I think you do that through your board evaluation, okay. even to ask those sorts of questions. Mm. It might be, um, yeah, I think you could test it in lots of different ways. I don't have a definitive answer because boards do it quite differently mm. around the place. Yes. I think. Um, I'd agree with you, probably one of the most successful ways I've seen is that um, they actually stop and say, okay, risk appetites and tolerance is something that we need to know about and mm. it's important, but we actually need to start with us as a group. So it's mm. really a conversation around the table, mm. but then the conversation about the risk of the organisation is a flow on. Yep. So kind of two separate mm. things. Okay, so another um, question that we have is, how would you document or frame uh, a board's risk appetite statement? Right, well, um, I would recommend that the appetite statement is in relation to a specific strategic risk. So it might be around financial sustainability of the organisation. Um, I've got some formats that I'm happy to share with Governance Evaluator that we Lovely. can put on your website uh, for you to have a look at. Um, it's a bit of an art in writing them up. But they need to actually uh, be linked to indicators or evidence uh, that is measurable as well so that you can test your tolerance. Um, and that sh needs to be information that's updated on a regular basis to see how are we going with our tolerance. Are we at over or under? That's that's fantastic. So we might actually send that to everybody okay, fantastic. after this and make yep. sure that we have it up there. It might even be something that we could do another webinar on sometime. Yes. So people can actually log in and have mm. a look. That's mm. a really good idea. So let me have a look at some of these other questions. So um, what about... Um, in the the risk in a federated model. So we've got many different types of governance models and quite a lot of organisations actually sit in a federated model, mm. which is that, you know, they've got state boards and then they've got a federal board. Mm. And and the question is, um, how, how do you actually manage that risk? And the risk that we're talking about in this question is the difference between the federal views and the state views. Mm, that's a tricky and one. That's Very huge. interesting. It's absolutely huge, and that's that's often a people thing. issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would start with exploring the similarities and differences across the different federation uh, to understand, I suppose, what are our shared risks and what are our different risks. From a strategic risk perspective, I would hope or assume that the uh, strategy applies to the whole federation unless you're developing up your own state-based or locally-based strategic um, objectives. So that's probably a question. Do we have the same strategic objectives? Are there risks that we share across the whole of the business in relation to strategy? Understanding the differences and um, the similarities across the federation. Not being competitors with your other uh, gangs in the federated model. Um, that's always quite a tricky one, especially if you're applying for funding. So if we both go to National Health and Medical Research Council, for example, is New South Wales competing against Queensland, etc. So it's, I suppose, understanding that. Do you have shared directors across the federation? Um, is there any conflict of interest between the different states, etc.? Um, not being a competitor, I think, is a really important one from a, a state, a, a federated perspective as well. I don't know if that's answered your question. I hope it's, it has. it's helpful and um, we can follow up with more mm. information after this. Another question is about bridging the gap, if it exists, between the boards and the management's appetite. And that's actually a brilliant question because they're, they're they bound be... to be different. Yes. And um, 
that's because one has a strategic role and the other, of course, operational. So, Gabby, do you have some views on that one? Um, I suppose you've got to ask yourself who's sitting the strategic direction of the organisation and where is this business going uh, is probably an interesting question. It depends on your relationships between the board and the CEO as well. So you might have a very conservative CEO who hasn't got the appetite to go entrepreneurial and grow different services, etc. Oh, I think it's a bit of a, a negotiation uh, tightrope, that one. Um, Mm. What do you think, Fee? You're, you work in the world of relationships between CEOs yes, and I boards? Th I think um, bridging the gap is I, I see too often that um, we do a lot of educating with the board about the governance responsibilities mm. of risk and we don't necessarily do education with the management mm. or the executives mm. and CEOs and I think for them to be left out is a big mistake mm. and vice versa. Mm. I think uh, likewise it's good in, in our education for boards about risk to include, well, what would that role be then for the management? Mm. And so by understanding each other's roles, I think people are a lot more understanding. Mm. Um, one of the key things I do find is that um, if boards understand their role is to be strategic mm. and to drop down into analysis of operational things only when something's wrong mm. and they've got that mm. issue flagged to them, mm. uh, that behaviour does um, help management feel more comfortable mm. and um, like the board's not being too operational and mm. annoying. In other words, uh, putting their noses in but keeping their fingers out, that sort yep. of thing. Um, and I, But I do find one of the biggest issues is um, that we tend to think that governance training should only be for boards mm. and I have a, a real problem with that mm. and I think that um, that those two things should be shared and mm. that, that helps bridge the gap. I think that possibly the gap might also be an information, knowledge and data gap often okay. about on which you're basing your decisions. So yeah. is the board making evidence-based decisions with all of the full facts? Does the CEO know something totally different or understand the world or the perspective of operating in a regulated environment yeah. that the board don't have that same understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be that sort of information gap, knowledge gap going on. If that's um, the case, then there needs to be sort of a open meeting of the minds, I suppose, to thrash, to nut out the issues about why is our ap appetite so different. Mm. No, exactly. Is it something? Is it something you know that we don't? Mm. <laughs> what was it, the, Gabby, you actually have a fantastic saying uh, that you say to me that um, um, is an issue when boards try to discover information and executives or CEOs goes, there's nothing to know here. Or nothing what? to see here. Nothing Keep to walking. see here. Yes. Mm. So strategies for boards to be able to push through that is mm. really important. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So Gabby, another area um, that I think um, I, we get a lot of questions about when we're looking at evaluation results around risk and why are boards um, saying that, that there's things they want to learn about risk is that the first thing they might discover is yes, we do have a risk register. Mm. But when you, as a director, go and have a look at a risk register, it's just there is so much stuff on it. Mm. And I know you said before that they need to be written well, mm. but really boards need to manage risk. They need to be able to do a big job in a small time mm. of managing risk. And if I could just take us back again to that area of dashboard mm. reporting and mm. those sorts of things, mm. um, how do boards go about helping to work with executives to make sure that those reports are starting to come to the board? I think that they've got to demand less information, and, but it needs to be high quality information that is more succinct to the point to aid decision making. I don't know if you've been on boards where you get a huge bound copy of just so much information and especially for voluntary boards, when are you going to read that if you're working as well? You can't read it all the night before the board meeting. Our dashboards are one way to actually address that. I'd say from a strategic, uh, from a risk perspective and looking at the risk register, the board should really be only concentrating on the strategic risks. Strategic risks. Risks. So okay. they should only really be looking at four or five of those unless there is some very high um, risk from the operational area that needs to be escalated to the board as something mission critical. So the board shouldn't need to be looking um, on a regular basis at the 40 operational 
risks that are going on in the organisation. That's good. So that leads me to my next question. What then is the role of our board committees in helping to achieve those? They are the engine room for the board, really, of making sense of a lot of this stuff. Um, I suppose an audit and risk committee as well, you've really got to ask the question about how much um, you want to be overcoming them with operational risk activities as well. My sense is that they could probably have an operational risk dashboard where they are at least getting the comfort and assurance that things are being dealt with, uh, the controls are in place and being mitigated as well. Okay, because one of the key things that tends to happen is when boards evaluate themselves and then they identify oh, under risk management we actually should be um, not only knowing that we have a risk um, register, but of course not being reported to on every single risk on that register. Mm. Mm. Um, and then when they have an action to do something about that, they'll say, okay, that's the job of the Audit and Risk Committee. Mm. And um, the first thing is to the Audit and Risk Committee is to recommend to the whole board, well, these might be a hundred risks mm. on our risk register, but these are the five mm. that could be strategic indicate our strategic uncertainty, that's what you're saying. Yes, that's a good that's guide right. for mm. knowing which risk to choose. Mm. They're our uncertainty and strategy. I'd say for all of those staff who are listening today who are responsible for collating a whole range of information up to the board, um, that it really needs to be summarised, good quality stuff, not pages and pages and pages of detail. Um, one thing we see as well is a lot of business as usual uh, information on risk registers mm. that shouldn't be there. Um, so stuff around are we going to pass hospital accreditation, falls, etc. They're things that are happening every day in an organisation. They're bread and butter, um, pressure injuries, skin integrity, those sorts of stuff. That's Nursing 101 stuff that really should not be on the risk register. It's business as usual. You should have in place a whole range of activities around those particular issues um, so that they disappear off the risk register. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Well, Gabby, this has been incredibly helpful today and it's certainly been a terrific start to our series on mm. risk and then particularly for the health sector about clinical governance. Mm. And I think you've given some great insight into some of the areas that we certainly find in our evaluations yes. that are continually making it difficult for boards to know what is their role and what is their oversight role for risk. Mm. And I'm absolutely delighted that you're going to come back and we're going to run a webinar mm. on dashboards mm. um, for risk mm. because I would have to say that is 100% um, of a question. Um, I think I've just said that the wrong way. I think 100% of boards would like to know how to be that, assisted with that and I don't mm. think it matters how big or small your organisation mm. is. Mm. And thank you also. We look forward to the information about Risk appetite. Um, templates yep. for risk appetite statements. That's sure. going to be really helpful. Um, really terrific. And okay, I'm just just having a, a quick look through the uh, questions yes. before we before yeah. we say goodbye. And you've got some more too. Oh yes. Um, there was a question here uh, around aged care and disability services, which I thought would be interesting, especially um, mm. with the changing environment. Um, what are the impacts of the changing uh, of government deregulation on aged care and disability services in relation to risk? I think this is a really interesting question and a huge uh, uncertainty that's emerging for a lot of organisations. I mean, deregulation changes to um, development of the National Dis Disability Insurance Scheme mm -hmm. have really changed the way in which we understand uh, revenue. It's undermined revenue models. Um, models of care will need to ha will need to change and be more client directed. So there's some big nuts and bolts issues uh, around risk that are going to be happening. The changing nature of the sector, I think, is going to be very interesting as well. Um, I suppose from a strategic level and board level, you've got to start asking questions: Are we going to grow our business in this area, or are we going to consolidate or merge? Have we been sort of keeping our finger on the pulse of the environment out there to understand whether you know, we're going to be taken over or, you know, I suppose it comes back to what is our core purpose as an organisation and what's the scope of our business. Um, I think there's got to be a lot of thinking ahead on, board, for, on boards around aged care, um, especially when you've got private providers moving in if you're working sort of for state funded um, activities. Um, so it's very uncertain uh, times for those uh, areas. You've also got to, it once again comes back to appetite and tolerance really for disability and aged care. Um, 
do we want to be entrepreneurial about this? Uh, how much can we, and to what extent? Um, I suppose also the board's got to start thinking about the skill mix of the CEO and executive as well. Are they ready and able to deal with this change in model of activity? And um, I'd always say be very aware of what's happening geographically. Find out what's going on, who your competitors are in this new market and new model. Um, so lots to think about in that area. I think you're right. I think um, the uncertainty and one of the biggest risks that some boards relate to me in that sector is the speed with which they're being forced to make these decisions mm. and they're feeling like, God, what if we make the wrong one? Mm. So I guess that's an un that's a strategic risk right now. Yes, absolutely. Um, do you think that history tells us to try and uh, haste Hasten carefully. <laughs> yes, hasten carefully. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, get out there and find out what's going on is my advice uh, as well. Find out what's going on in the market. So I just uh, move forward today, fee to encouraging people to visit the VMIA yes. website. You don't have to be a client of ours to access our documents. Um, I'd say our practice guide about understanding risk management is one of our uh, most popular. Mm. Uh, publications, thousands of downloads. I actually still use it and when I came to VMIA I, it was a really helpful layperson's guide to helping me understand what are the nuts and bolts of this thing called risk management, what's a strategy, what's a risk um, statement look like, those sorts of things. So I really highly recommend that. We've got stuff on the VGRMF, the risk management framework and uh, especially around attestation, risk culture, interagency risk if you're working in the area of um, joint objectives with other organisations, uh, very helpful reads. Um, inquiries, you can just contact us at our general contact number depending on who you are and what your questions are. We have a uh, client relationship team uh, that actually triage these interactions and can shoot them in the right direction of course, always happy to talk about insurance as well. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, so that's fantastic. Thanks very much, Fee. Thanks for your time, everybody. It's been uh, really interesting to hear your questions, and hopefully, you've got something out of today. Gabby, thank you so much. Um, I've got a lot out of today, and I think everybody else has. And we've got people listening from all over Australia today. So, thank you very much. And um, I really have found this a terrific talk today, and I'm looking forward to the next ones in your series. Okay, marvelous. Thanks.